everybody, wherever you're watching us from, uh, it's such a pleasure to be here again tonight with um, Reverend Victor Adeyemi. You're very much welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Eggs. I'm so excited to um, have you finding me the questions today <laughs> um, about money as we yeah. discuss uh, finances in ministry. And I'm truly very excited. Excited because, uh, to start with, I have Pastor Shegun here asking me the questions, and he's a senior pastor of Hill City, and I'm really so excited about him. I've had the privilege of mentoring him for decades. Uh, these days, uh, when we discuss, I don't know who's mentoring who, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's been such a tremendous blessing and, Thank and you, inspiration, sir. and um, I had a lot of confidence that whatever the questions will be in the minds of my mentees, he will be able to envision them. And so uh, I've not gone through his questions for me. Um, this is really coming to you live, and we're going to have an exciting time. I'm not sure we'll be able to get through this in All the questions. a single broadcast. Uh, we might yeah. have to do uh, another, uh, I shouldn't call it a repeat broadcast, but a sequel. A sequel to this, definitely. Yeah. There's a lot that we have to talk about. Oh, yeah. There's a lot that we want to ask. First, yes. we would appreciate you for all your years of mentoring for all the time that you have poured into people, you. Uh, that you have blessed this generation. You are one of those that um, has, um, over the years, given us a model to follow Thank when you. it comes to character, when it comes to finances, Thank when it comes you. to ministry. Okay, as far as ministry is concerned, yes. you are a worthy model. And I know so many people are joining us tonight just because they want to hear what you have to say about some of these issues when it comes to money. Yeah. So if you're joining us, if you're watching us live on Instagram or Facebook or wherever you're watching, you can send in your questions live and we can take them right here in the studio. Right. Um, so let's start off, sir. All right. uh, what's the place of money in ministry? But the place of money is a very crucial place. Um, I remember when I was a young minister, I heard the late Archbishop Benson in the say, uh, anointed minus money. It was annoyance. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I felt, what a carnal statement to make. What we need to fulfill the ministry is the anointing. And once we are anointed, mm. uh, we can get anything done. But after I became a pastor myself, and I realized how that, how much you are able to do is very, very dependent on how much resources you have, you have in your hands, particularly financial resources and in my opinion after human resources i believe financial resources are the most important resources that you need in order to fulfill your vision okay the language of the world economy is money it is uh, through money we are able uh, to buy and sell in this world and mm. nobody can carry out ministry uh, without having adequate resources in order to be able to accomplish ministry. And I have known the joy of having resources to accomplish vision. And I've also known the frustration of not, of having, not having resources. resources to so, ministry. in fact, in um, uh, choosing this subject today, I mean, I, to start with, I, I took inspiration and must acknowledge the, some suggestions. Uh, we asked questions about subjects people will want us to cover. Talk about. Uh, on a live broadcast some time ago. And, and I will never forget the suge suggestion that came from the Bishop Febe Dahosa and a few other people about mentoring ministers out of my years of experience in ministry. Yeah. And in talking about the subject, this one ranked one of the highest that people were interested in hearing about. And mm. so I'm sharing from my successes and my failures. failures. Because if I look behind me, there are certain things I wish I could do all over again. Mm. I wish that I respected the place of money mm. uh, more than I did when I was starting out in ministry. I've come okay. to realize that without adequate resources, vision will only remain vision. So some, some yeah. of the opinion that um, God provides, yeah. okay, so there's provision for every vision. That's right. So, so the mindset is that if God has called me, yeah. God will make the money available. Oh, yes. I believe that uh, in a to a very large extent mm. um, if in fact one i believe that the number one key to getting the finances to do ministry is to do what god has called you to do mm. god will not fund or finance a project that he has not mandated mm. 
And so it must be mandated, it must be commanded by heaven. Mm. And when heaven has commanded it, the resources follow. One of the most exciting uh, uh, things I've discovered over the years is getting an instruction from God to carry out a project or to do a thing, and then we experience miracle supplies. I would remind mm. you, for instance, of when I received this uh, direction to organize a crusade yeah. uh, that we we had in 2007 yeah, at Liberty Jubilee. Stadium, Jubilee. Yeah, yeah. And the Jubilee cost us at that time, this was 11 years ago, over 12 million naira to mm. organize. Uh, when the vision itself came, uh, the initial budget was 5 million. And um, my faith was up for 5 million. When we couldn't use the Adama Sigba Stadium of the city of Ibadan, we had to use the Liberty Stadium. Everything changed about the project. But you are right in the center of it with me. At yeah, the time. definitely. And you can remember how miracle after Upon miracle, miracle after yes. miracle took place. Right till the very last minute yes. of that crusade, we were still getting miracle supplies. At the end of the crusade, there was no money left, <laughs> but we did not owe a dime. A dime, yeah, definitely. So, uh, that beauty of of supernatural flow is usually there when God mandates a project. So mm. God provides for the vision that is from Him, even though I've also discovered over time that there are times when the provision is not there and we may not discern the provision where the provision is or not play our part in mm. cooperating with God in order for the provision to flow. So can we say that the availability of funds... Yeah is proof that yeah. whatever we want to do is the will of God. Well, I will Or the not. absence of funds yes, really is so. proof <laughs> that God is not in it. We, if there is absence of funds and we do everything doable to get the funds and the funds are not mm. coming, then God is not in it. God is too faithful not to supply the funds uh, to finance a project that comes from Him. Especially mm. if the project is from God, and we also get the timing right because, okay. again, there are times when God's given a vision, we jump out before the time. It reminds me of, of your crusade. I'm not sure you were with me on, on that one. I think I was too young uh, <laughs> to be a part of that <laughs> one there. I remember vaguely, yes, though. Yeah. That there was this crusade that we did in Oyo. We had to carry the small generator that our church had. Yeah. We had to carry the few equipments our church had down to Oyo. The amplifier blew up. The generator blew up. I came to understand, no, church equipment, mm. I've got to be church equipment, exclusive equipment, I've got to be separate. equipment. Mm. At the end of the day, we really couldn't find the finance to publicize as we should have publicized. You know, it was my zeal trying to get the job done. Mm. And yet, just some years down the line, we will do this 12 billion hour crusade. So, um, timing is important. So, the, 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 the vision, the mandate from heaven, then the, getting the timing right. If... That we, if those two things are in place, then the resources will flow. Okay. Um, and then, especially if we also use methods that are scriptural, then the resources will flow. But the availability of resources in itself does not necessarily mean it is, it is from God. So, so it's possible for me to have a dream yeah. and um, God is in it, mm -hmm. but um, I don't have money to prosecute yeah. um, the vision. That's right. Okay. It is possible when... It is not time, it's not time. for it. If, if you are jumping ahead of time, then the resources are not there. It's like Moses. Moses, the deliverer was in him. The judge over Israel was in him. The guy jumps out before time. He is rejected by the very Jews he's supposed to lead. Yeah. And then the very same Pharaoh he is supposed to stand before and rescue the children of Israel from, he runs away from that same Pharaoh. There was no... No backup from heaven. It was the right mission. Right mission. But the right timing, timing was wrong. Yeah, okay. God did not intervene at that time and say, oh yeah, Moses, I've called you to do it. and I'm backing you up. Don't mm. run away. Mm. No, he ran away and the heavens were silent. Mm. Until 40 years later when God now said, it's now time to go back to Pharaoh. So, so that makes me... Um, <laughs> so I'm thinking, what's the place of ambition mm. in ministry, in success in ministry? Yeah. Okay. Um, that, that place of, you know, this thing has to be done. Mm -hmm. Of a man waking up and saying, yeah. um, this has to be done. L let me present it this way, sir. Right. Um, somebody said that if you want to buy, buy a brand new brain, That's right. go for the brain of a Pentecostal. <laughs> because they don't use their brains. God tells them everything they do. 
when we look at people in the secular, yeah. um, without a voice, without saying a leading, yeah. they decide, you know what, I want to go for this, That's right. and I go for it. That's right. Is there a place for that in ministry? Well, the way I would put it is, um, when it comes to ministry, the initiative of heaven has to precede all that we do. However, these divine initiatives don't always come to us in spectacular ways. Okay. Now, about the crusade I mentioned earlier, I sat down in, in one uh, similar program where I went to preach the year before, and um, uh, it was supposed to be a minister's uh, a conference. It was um, a theater ministry, Mount Zion, that invited me to come and speak to, uh, to uh, drama ministers that night. And I was at the Adamatic Bar Stadium of Ibadan. I sat down, and as I sat down on the platform with, with thousands of people in the banisters, um, I, I sensed the Holy Spirit impressing my heart that night and speaking in the still small voice in my heart. There was just this flow of, of, of inspirational thoughts that came to me that I discerned to be God speaking, that there were mm. unbelievers in the crowd. And so when I was done ministering to those ministers, I should dovetail the message into an evangelistic appeal and that unbelievers will be saved. It was supposed to be a program for of ministers. drama ministers. Mm. So I did exactly what I sensed the Lord was leading me to do. And here comes streaming down hundreds of people to give their lives mm. to Christ. And I was at, a, at the point of tears. I was so overwhelmed. The evangelist in me was so moved. I sat down at the end of it and it was like a thousand voices were singing, you can do this for me. You can do this too. Mm. You can organize a crusade in this place, fill this place up, and even win more souls. Mm. So uh, it was a very strong moment of uh, being under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Very supernatural. I couldn't doubt that God was dealing with me that night. Mm. However, there are times when the will of God comes to us like a strong desire, just a, a desire in me. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 says, It is God who works in you but to will and to do of his good pleasure. So there are times when there's a strong desire for me to do something godly. And so, and that is in line with the will of God. Psalm 37 verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. heart. Now, I would like to separate that from ambition in a sense. Um, uh, I, 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 I may just get ambitious that at times out of my flesh. If I'm an ego, okay. it make me ambitious. Yes. Okay. I may feel that I am in uh, X, Y, and Z churches did this. They've uh, done this. Uh, we ought also to, to do, do the it. same. Uh, 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 Pastor so and so has a TV station. I also ought to have oh, one. Bishop so and so has a university. I also ought to have one. After all, we are contemporaries. I can feel like that and get ambitious that way. Mm -hmm. I, however, we don't have heaven's guarantee mm -hmm. uh, that um, that God is with me on the project. So I must be able to decipher between such uh, godly desires planted in my heart by God and the things that ego will bring about no, or that want to result from the ideas of men. Yeah. So when somebody says, um, I decided to do it to the glory of God yeah. and cites the example of David and the temple, yeah. he was going to build God a temple. Yeah. We don't have any proof that it was a divine idea in the sense that God didn't tell him That's right. to build it. Yeah. And even when God said, um, you are not the one to build That's it. Right. Okay, it's your son that would build it. Yes. David took the initiative to That's make right. the materials available. Okay. Exactly. Uh, if somebody says, you know, that's my frame of thought. Yeah. You know, I just want to build God a university. I want to do this for God, to the glory of God. Yeah. Uh, and the person succeed at it, succeeds at it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it does not necessarily mean he is called to do it. There are times when you have resources, but you do not have the mandate. There are okay. times like that. I, um, uh, most of the time, I mean, you find a few instances like that. You have mm. more mandates than, <laughs> than money. <laughs> than money. <laughs> mm. But um, I was with one of my mentors one day, and he said to me, he said, Victor, on this campus right now, we have enough equipment for 24-hour television. Mm. He said, we acquired this equipment, we can broadcast to all our branches around the world with it. And interestingly, the same equipment, we can use them to run 24-hour Christian television. Mm. So I said, so Papa, why not, sir? Why, why, why are you not doing it? He said, because it is not mandated. Mm. He said, mm. so the equipment are there. He said, the resources, uh, the resources are there, human resources, everything is in place. 
Mm. He said, but I have been praying and I do not have the matching orders. He said, until I have the matching orders, we will not do it. Mm. And this was about six years ago mm. or seven. Mm. Till today, it's still, still not, not done. done it. Because he says he was here from heaven mm. um, in order to do it. Because it's not everything doable that, that we are all called to do that should be mm. done. Mm. And the, the impact and result of some of these things may not be very apparent in the beginning. Mm. But the truth is that when we operate beyond the parameters of the grace of God upon our lives, we stretch excessively and stress ourselves out. Mm. And that's why you will have heard stories of men of God experiencing burnout. Burnout. Mm. We are, they, they just, you know, are out of strength, out of power, out of ability to continue in ministry. Mm. Some even die before their time and all of that. And God has not called any of us to die before our time. We are, mm. just, we are called to serve Him. And so, it is rather more important that we do what we are called to, called do, to do rather than right. anything we feel we can do. Okay. And by the way, as you're watching us live, you can send in your questions either on Facebook or on Instagram um, as Reverend Victor continues to share with us tonight. So I want you to talk to this young man. Mm. Um, he is certain he's called into ministry. Mm. Now, there are two issues, a number of issues. Number one, many, many people say that um, people are doing ministry for the sake of money. Yeah. He doesn't want to do yeah, that. Yeah, that all. He doesn't want to do that. That's right. Secondly, he doesn't have the money hmm. to do the ministry. Yeah. He doesn't want to do it for money. Yeah, that's right. But then he doesn't even have money yes. to do the ministry. That's right. And then thirdly, he's afraid um, for his future. Hmm. If I'm not going to do it for money, yeah. how am I going to be taken care of? Hmm. So many young people, yeah. um, that's their dilemma. That's right. So how do we resolve this uh, issue? I was in the same dilemma, interestingly, as a teenage boy... The call of God came upon my life, and I didn't understand that ministry is something you should do for money. In fact, I felt and still feel it is an absurdity for anybody to want to go into the ministry for money. For heaven's sake, there are thousands of businesses we can do to make money. There are various careers and jobs we can go into for money. It's unfortunate that the world, because of a few charlatans among us, have come to characterize us all and, you know, bundled us together as being in there for the money. Mm. Some have even misunderstood just for doctrinal reasons. Mm. You know, there are various methods of fundraising in the Bible and just because, um, okay, maybe I believe in tithing, you don't believe in tithing, then, oh, because you believe in tithing, then that means you are in You're need for, uh, the money. Know, for the money uh, and mm. all of that. And it's all hogwash, really, to be candid. The truth is, uh, a truly called person wants to serve God and simply do what God called him to do and be a blessing to people. Okay. Every genuinely called person will have the working of the Holy Spirit on the inside of him. Uh, building compassion, uh, inspiring compassion in him uh, for the needy. If you are called to be an evangelist, you have compassion for the lost. With tears, you pray and agonize for souls. If you are called to teach people, ignorance just irritates you mm. and your heart breaks when you see people ignorant about spiritual things. You want to see them victorious in their Christian lives. And, and we can go on and on talking about the various effects of calling and anointing on our lives. So mm. I was concerned, especially because as a teenage boy, my family was in abject poverty. Now I have dreamt of becoming a lawyer. I loved to argue and I felt I would enjoy the job and it was dignifying. I loved the ropes. I love how articulate lawyers were in the law court. I love the, 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 the presentation of their mm. facts, of their arguments. And I loved it when people win cases. I, I would watch uh, dramas over and over again of, of cases in court. Anything like that was just fascinating for me. But secondly, I wanted to also be a politician. Because in Nigerian politics, I knew it was dirty politics. This was during the Second Republic in Nigeria. My dad himself was also a politician at the time. And I saw, you know, and had an inkling to have people stole money. And I was interested in stealing from the national world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for the call. Then I got born again. <laughs> and I began to experience a heart change. Mm. But now this is a concern. I'm going to become a minister of the gospel. And 
all I could see about the pastors of our church when I was growing up was poverty. They, mm. they lived in these tiny two-bedroom pastoriums around um, the church compounds, either in my village or or in uh, Niger State where we first lived or in Ilone Kwara State where I lived at the time. And they were very poor. I did not want to be poor. So, excuse me, I was very much concerned about all of that. And what I would say, you know, uh, if, to any young man who is concerned about that is, number one, God is faithful to take care of you. He has called you. He's faithful to take care of you. When Jesus called his disciples and sent them out to preach the gospel, he told them not to bother taking pause, or scream, nothing for the journey, no provision for the journey, that the devil is worthy of his wages. In other words, you work for God, God will take care of you. Mm. So there is that place of confidence in God. Secondly, I will counsel that people, the fact that they are called into the ministry does not mean they should lack skills or mm. lack the ability to do business or just, just develop some common sense in uh, common sense uh, uh, you know wisdom to invest money and and know how to take care of themselves because when I look into the Bible I see the example of Paul yeah who as an apostle was spreading the gospel around and there were occasions when Paul would do business he was making tents even had some business partners called Priscilla and Aquila a couple yeah. they did tent making business together. They made the tents, they sold them. They even took the money and put some of the money into um, into the ministry. the ministry. And with these days, with increasing uh, skepticism about the work of the ministry out there, those who have skills and can make some money should make it. By mm -hmm. the time they see that you are making your own money, they will not be able to abuse you because they know that you are even putting your own money into the ministry. However... If what God has called you to do is ministry and the force and the strength of the calling requires you devoting your time, full time like we call it, oh. into ministry, obey God and rather than man and be certain God will take care of you. Oh, thank you so much, sir. Um, what I've also observed is um, the place of the financial intelligence mm. and the capacity to manage resources yeah. of this minister yeah. now. Okay, um, I personally believe that it's possible for God to provide, yeah. but sometimes we don't experience multiplication yeah. if we don't know how to manage exactly. the resources God has given us. Exactly. By working with you and observing you for years, yeah. I know you to be a very prudent ma manager of resources. Thank you. Thank so, sir, so tell us, um, where did that come from? Mm. How do you develop the capacity mm. to manage resources? Mm. The average pastor knows how to pray, study the Bible, That's and right. preach. Okay, a lot of times people don't get taught yeah. on how to manage resources. resources in so please hands. share with us. Sir. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I, I um, had the uh, the privilege of serving under um, uh, uh, Reverend George Adebuye, uh in ministry, and I observed his prudence. In fact, uh, just a few weeks ago. We were together ministering in the same program in the United States. We ministered there August every year. And we went out shopping. And I couldn't help but shake my head <laughs> because he has not changed. Mm. He has not changed with his shrewdness and prudence, mm. trying to buy things at the best, or the most affordable prices. And not because he does not have the money to buy anywhere he wants but because he believes in getting value. Value for money. From money. And the reality is, from the parable of the talents in the Bible, where five talents were given to a man, two talents to a second one, one talent to a third one, uh -huh. you will notice resources are always flowing from poor managers of resources into the hands so of good managers, managers of resources. Uh -huh. Now, it's very easy to excuse away people who have resources to do ministry. Poor managers will, oh, it's his father that has money. Oh, it is because he started on, on, a, on, a, on a wonderful you know, platform. platform yeah. Oh, it's because he has rich people in his church. But mm. the truth is, 
good managers of resources increase them and multiply them. Now, mm. this is God's method. He wanted 7 billion people on the earth. He started with one man. Out of that one man, he pulls a second person. Out of the two, then he gets he gets uh, scores. Out of the scores, hundreds, out of the hundreds, thousands, out of thousands, millions, out of millions, billions. And that's why God was cool when the whole earth was filthy with sin. He wiped everybody out, preserved a family of eight people, Noah's family. Mm. From the eight, we have the seven billion we have today. Okay. The children of Israel were messing up big time in the wilderness. God told Moses in Numbers uh, 13, uh, Numbers 14, allow me. Let me wipe these people off. Of you, Moses, I will make another nation. Mm. In other words, just Moses, his wife, and his children were enough for God. Out of them, God can make a whole nation again. Mm. Because he's a God of the seed. He's the God of managing resources and making the small become big. So, uh, we must learn to believe very much in this. Interestingly, after the lessons I learned uh, from my own pastor, uh, there was a time uh, uh, in uh, pastoring Global Harvest Church in Ibadan when uh, we had this building project. We, yeah. we first did, thank God, that building has given away to a bigger one that mm. is about to be dedicated now. But I remember that at the time, there was, uh, we wanted to have this convention. I wanted to finish up the building for the convention, just like we found ourselves in a similar situation right now. And the idea I had was, somebody suggested, let's call some members together. They've given, we can ask them to give more, but they might not mind lending us some money. And then we give them the money after convention. Uh, so, oh, uh, we called those members and very willingly they lent to the church for um, uh, various sums of money. Mm. After lending us money, the next thing was, we really wanted to celebrate big time. God had been so good to us. It was third anniversary. We decided to celebrate Sunday to Sunday. I had about seven guest speakers. By the time the convention was done, we were so spent, we were terribly broke to even now get money to, to give back to those who let money. It was money. difficult. And mm. the cash flow was really very poor for the following two months. So mm. I was worried. And then... But I decided to speak, and in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. I asked uh, one of the church um, uh, leaders, one of my lieutenants in church, who at the time was overseeing 16 branches of a particular bank. I felt this man might have some advice for me, since he works in the financial sector. So I said to him, I said, sir, um, I have this situation on hand. We borrowed some money from members. Convention is over right now. The cash flow is so poor. Every week, the money coming in is not even enough to take care of the bills, talk less of paying back the loan. And here I am for two months. I've not paid back the, the loans that we loan from members, and I'm concerned about my name, my integrity as a pastor. And he said to me, he said, Pastor, it's not that difficult. He said, what I want you to do is this. Determine from today that from the income of the church this coming Sunday, you will set aside... 10% or 20% of the income of the church. Mm. And you will uh, dedicate it towards loan repayment. I also want you to talk to each and every one of those people who loaned the church money and ask them that they should kindly be patient with the church. Carry out an assessment, whether it is three months it will take you or six months or one year in order to pay off the loan. Tell them that they should kindly be patient with the church, that you are committed to paying the loan and that by the grace of God within the next one year, the loan will be paid or within the next six months or within the next three months. When he said that, it was like, whoo, light came on my darkness. Mm. I quickly did some head, rough calculation in my head. If we can set aside 20%, I was like, we can make this thing within three to six months. And that was exactly what I did. I went around everybody, promising them they would get their money in six months. One or two people said, don't oh, forget about the money, Pastor. So that they would reduce the weight the burden, on yeah. my shoulders. Mm. And then I told the accountant. 20% every week set aside. Mm. These are the people, you will know all the people we owe money, start paying them one after the other. So every Tuesday morning, we decided who we are going to pay. And we're paying them like that. We started from the least committed to the church to the most committed. In three months, we were done. Wow. Challenging. It was mm. a stretch, mm. but we were done. When we were now done, I went to thank the man who gave me the advice. Thank you so much for your advice. Do you know we made it in three months? Mm. But it was tough. Mm. Now we are glad we can have more money to spend because it was really tough. He said, sir, 
don't spend that money. I said, what? I said, it was a stretch. It was difficult. He said, don't spend that money. Hmm. For you to have survived three months without spending that 20%, 20%. shows, it is possible. Hmm. I said, well, it was tough. He said, sir, it was tough, but it is possible to set aside that 20% for capital projects. Hmm. He said, you will always have some money. He said, how will it feel for you to stand before the church and say, hey, guys, we have this two million naira project. We have half a million naira in savings. It will inspire the members. He said, always set something aside. Hmm. And that was where it all started. And you, where you became a pastor in the church, got yeah. to know about our capital savings account yes. and how in those days we even went, went out stretch beyond 20%, yes, or yeah. 30%, and at the time 40%, mm. you know, uh, you know, capital savings for projects. Yeah. And when I look into the account and I see that money, I'm so excited. <laughs> Boldness and faith is inspired mm. to undertake projects. And so we learned that art of prudent management of resources. resources. And when we began to do that, and that led to what we know, what we have in Global Average Church, just start to tree allocation. We call them today. <laughs> you know, we have all this money, we call start to tree allocation, and whatever is left is left for the current expenditure. That's the reason why we are able to finance projects, plant churches, build buildings, and so on and so, so forth yeah. in our ministry mm. today. So, when you manage resources well, now there's this mentality, it is not enough. Mm. That it is not enough mentality does not allow us to save. Mm. Whereas, when you do not save, the saving is the barest minimum investment you can do with money. The guy mm. with the one talent said, oh, I know that you are a very hard man, reaping where you do not sow. So I took your talent and I hid it somewhere. The man said, the least you could have done was to have saved the money and let it yield interest for me. Mm. That's the minimum we can do with money. Put something aside, save it in an interest-yielding account. No matter how and, small. You know, no matter how small. Mm. And it's amazing how much money at times when we put money to fix deposits, how much we're able to get out of it, how inspiring it all is. So, bottom line, the better we manage money, the more money we have. The more money multiplies in, in our, our hands. hands. And we should all never waste money. We should go for, I mean, you've been there when we've had to negotiate together. Yeah. <laughs> knocking down prices. Mm. And at times people would, people are not finding it funny at all, but we try to squeeze as much as possible. And, and, and the more you do that, the more value you get from money. The more you respect money. In, like in the words of Mike Murdoch, who says, whatsoever you respect, you attract. attract. Yeah. Whatsoever you despise, you repel. Mm. If you respect money and treat it very well and seek to get the best value out of it, you will attract more of it. Thank you very much, sir. Um, quickly, sir, help us deal with um, peer pressure oh. in ministry. <laughs> uh, because I think a lot of times, some of the projects that overwhelm us as pastors right. sometimes are things that um, mm. you've seen somebody else do. That's right. um, even we fellow ministers, I don't exactly. know, I think sometimes we put pressure on ourselves. Oh, yeah, we do at when you have a testimony to share, you share it. So when somebody too has a testimony to share, they feel like they have to share it. Oh, yes. So it's now your time to be under pressure. That's right. So how do you deal with peer pressure in now ministry? That's, that's very tough. And you're probably asking somebody who um, knows what it is to have friends in ministry mm. whose ministries are far wealthier than his own. Uh, but at the same time, I'm also conscious of the fact that our ministry is far wealthier in material terms. Because again... When you talk about wealth, the way God looks at things at times is different from the way we look at them. Think, so yeah. When you look at the seven churches of Asia Minor that Jesus spoke to in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, a particular church, he said, I know you are rich. And then he said, but you are poor. Another church, he said, I know you are poor. He said, but you are rich. Oh. So the poor church, in financial and material terms, was rich in the sight of Jesus. The rich church, in financial and material terms, was poor in the sight of Jesus. So God looks at things differently. But the truth is... In our humanity, when our friends share testimonies with us, uh, we also want to have the same thing. Mm. I don't know about you, but <laughs> I feel like having what my friends have <laughs> mm. also. But we must learn uh, that just like in the words of Paul, who talked about those who, in measuring themselves uh, among with themselves, themselves and are not wise. wise, we need to understand that we all have different races to run, 
will all have different mandates from heaven. We also even do have different capacities. capacities. Do you notice there in Matthew chapter 25 in the parable of the talents? He gave five talents to one, two talents to the second, one talent to the third. It says to every man severally according to his, his abilities. abilities. So the capacity of each person to manage the resources determines how much God commits into his hands. Mm. There are times when, when it now comes to this issue of capacity. Capacity is a combination of two things. It's a combination of your talents at times, and then on the other hand, your acquired skills. So there are times when some people are just born with extraordinary capacity. You know how much I always admire <laughs> your multi-talented uh, personality, for instance. And mm. um, I'm always amazed how you do it. I'm like, how does PCX do these things? You, you are the person who you can sit down, design graphics, and teach your graphic designers how to design the graphics. You, you are the same person who can learn how to edit a thing and train your own staff about how to do it. The technical competence is there. The communication ability is there at the same time. The managerial you know, ability is there at the same time. And it, it's just so wonderful. But if I have one talent, mm. I must not because somebody else has five talents. Now despise my one talent. You despise it, you lose it. Mm. Whereas the one can become two. Yes. The two can become four. The four can become eight. Mm. The eight can become 16. Yeah. I know, I know, I know. If you respect what you have. So, bottom line is, um, celebrate what other people have in terms of abilities and in terms of resources. Mm. But always ensure you do not stretch yourself beyond your, the parameters of the grace of God upon your life mm. uh, out of baseless competition or comparison or just trying to impress other people. This mentality of living to impress people kills people before their time. Mm. It, it, it's a very terrible thing. So you see people embark on projects they cannot finance, and that's where people now get very shady and crooked, mm. and they're trying to get resources by hook or crook, uh, just so that uh, the other guy does not think he's better than I am or bigger than who I am. Mm. Let's face it, in ministry, there will always be people at times who will have more influence than you have in ministry. There are times when people will pastor churches or, minister, or lead ministries bigger than yours. Do just be secure in your own calling. Mm. Um, I like to tell people that uh, the God of Ephraim and Manasseh uh, was just to both Ephraim and Manasseh. I mean, the, the, the saying became in Israel, may God make you, when they are blessing children, May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. Interestingly, Ephraim was a younger brother. Now, you remember how Jacob crossed, crossed his hands, hands over yeah. those two sons of Joseph and blessed them. The right hand meaning Ephraim was going to be more blessed than the one he laid his left hands on, which was Manasseh, the older brother. However, if the prayer is, may God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh, it meant that Manasseh was also blessed. Yes. Manasseh was also a model child. The mm. blessed child that Israel prayed that their children will be like. But Ephraim was still greater just by divine sovereignty. Mm. Uh, God does not owe any of us anything. Mm. He has given us the privilege of life. And then now gives us the privilege of walking in his purpose and his divine destiny for each and every one of us. Mm. Let us learn to be content with what we have, celebrate it with hearts full of gratitude to God, and we'll see God bless us in an ever-increasing measure. measure. I remember visiting one of my mentors again one day, and I said, Sir, um, when since the last time I came to see you, the church has grown by 200%, even though it's not like we're impressed with the numbers we are counting right now at all. And I was talking like that because this man passed us a massive church in this country. And um, I was despising the numbers that we had. So I said, uh, not that we are impressed. He said, Victor, you should be impressed. Mm. You should be impressed. Can you bring any of those people to your church? He now talked about how from the days of little beginnings, he celebrated small numbers with dances and praises to God 
knowing fully well that it was God that was blessing his effort. Mm. He said, you should be impressed. You should be grateful to God. You cannot bring one woman be to your church. Mm. It's God that is bringing them. So let's learn to celebrate where we are, where we are, on the way to where we are going. And even if in God's destiny plan, he does not plan you know, the church or the ministry to be as big as somebody else's, let us celebrate what God has Stop. done and what God is doing in our own midst mm. and be thankful and grateful and happy mm. with what God is doing. I believe just like Jethro advised Moses, so is it in the kingdom of God. Moses was to appoint people to share ministry with him and Jethro advised him to appoint captains of tens, captains of hundreds, captains of thousands. Mm. And that's the way it is sometimes. God has his captains of tens of hundreds, of thousands. He has captains of millions. Mm. Few men of God who leave millions of followers. Mm. Whichever captain you are, be grateful for the privilege of yeah. service. So, mm. so how do you separate um, contentment from laziness? <laughs> <clears throat> so the, most of the time, this is how it happens in ministry. That's right. The, the, the pastor of 5,000 yeah. looks like the guy pastoring 200 people <laughs> and tells him there's something you're not doing right. Yeah. If you do it this way, this way, this way, this way, you will get, my you will get my kind of results. Mm. And the pastor of 200 says, look, I have done everything. everything you know, I have done everything. <laughs> yes. I just don't have mm -hmm. your results. Mm. You know, mm. you are telling him to be content now. Yes. Um, the other person is saying you're lazy. Mm. You are not working hard enough. Mm. We as humans, when we look at people, sometimes it's difficult to judge. Yeah. Is this the measure of this person mm. or is this person lazy? lazy. So let's look at self-assessment now. That's right. How can the pastor tell himself, this is my measure, mm. as opposed to, I'm just being lazy? The way you can tell yourself, this is my measure, is by ensuring you are doing all that there is to do. When I say you are doing all that there is to do, is that you are faithfully shepherding the flock that, that God gave to you. This flock ought to be fed with the word of God, this flock ought to be adequately cared for. And there are times when they are not adequately cared for. Again, the principle in finances comes into even uh, you know, membership now. Um, poor managers of people lose people mm. to good managers, managers of people. Of people. Mm. And there are churches with very good care systems where the people are well looked after. I watched this documentary about... Um, the SY largest church in the world, the Yoido Full Gospel Central Church of uh, South Korea, many years ago. Uh, and the documentary was titled Biggest Little Church. Mm. And biggest because it had over half a million members at the time. Little because the entire church was made up of tiny microcosms of mm. the larger body, larger body called house fellowships over 50,000 cells. And all these cells were well documented and their membership were well documented. So much that, according to David Young, they could account for every single individual in details. Wow. Very responsible church. Mm. Very caring assembly. So, um, are you caring for the people God sent to you? So, if I know I'm feeding them with the word of God, I'm caring for them adequately, I'm ensuring that we have a good atmosphere of worship. I'm connecting them with God consistently. We have systems and structures to ensure their spiritual development. We create opportunities of service for them. Mm. I'm doing what God has called me to do. Now, if at the end of the day, the church is now not growing to the size of my friend's church, so mm. be it. Mm. If I'm doing everything I ought to do to God be the glory 1 Corinthians 3, 6, Paul planted and pulled us water. But God, God gave the increase. Only God gives increase. And when the increase comes, we should give all the glory to God. And nobody should despise another man because he does not have his level of increase numerically. Mm. So at the end of the day, God is not going to judge uh, matters with numbers. The guy with the largest number is not necessarily going to get the biggest reward in heaven. Mm. No, it is how faithfully each person mm. has obeyed what God's called him to do. And mm. moreover, uh, these issues are at times also affected by sociological factors. I mean, 
Uh, somebody's church is in a very large city, another one is in a smaller city. What do you expect? Mm. There are other sociological factors like, oh, I'm a pastor and um, be probably because of my ethnicity or because of uh, uh, my social status, um, I'm able to appeal to a part of the demography that that is the that that has the greatest population in my community. But again, I may be privileged with finances to mm. be able to take the congregation to a very comfortable place Thank of worship. worship yeah. <laughs> I remember one time years ago when uh, we had the church in in Ibadan. We moved the church from a beautiful air conditioned uh, hall in a in, in a lovely new hotel, and we took the church to Liberty Road where it sits today. And at that time, we, found we, had, we didn't have a roof over our heads. We were using <laughs> kind of piece to cover our yeah. heads. So I took people from an air-conditioned hall with very comfortable seats to sit on plastic chairs without roof over their heads, under canopies. We didn't even have washroom facilities at the time. Half of the church stopped coming. And I was now wondering, I thought the people loved Jesus. <laughs> why why didn't they come in anymore? Well, I sent out some young men to do some survey for me and find out why they were not coming to church. Several of them told, several young people told the, the guys I sent out, I, I used to go to, to, to that, our church used to worship in that beautiful hotel. It was called Divan Rovans Hotel at that time. But after some time, they said they have built their church and they don't even have a roof there. And all that, that we should go there. Yeah, they followed them because I, I was enjoying AC, air conditioner, <laughs> uh, you know, in the other place and it was very accessible for me. Mm. So you see sociological factors affecting membership and even consequently finances. Mm. <laughs> so so um, as um, our time is um, running oh, out, wow. uh, but let's, let's talk about raising funds. Yes. How do we raise funds for <laughs> ministry? Raising funds is a matter of methodology. Mm. Now, when you look at the Old Testament, you will see God institute certain ways that funds were to be raised. For instance, there were offerings, various sacrificial offerings brought to the temple in the Bible days. Uh, the, the, the trespass offerings were there. There were offerings of thanksgiving. There was first fruits. There was tithe. These offerings were brought, and they were brought primarily for the maintenance of the priesthood, the, the priests and the temple, and... Um, um, also, some of uh, some portion of the offering was also given to take care of widows and mm. orphans. That was a method that God instituted and attached to the Levitical priesthood uh, and the temple in the Old Testament. We come over to the New Testament, and there are just some basic principles. One of the things we must admit is that the New Testament was not full of as much structure as mm. the Old mm. Testament. But there were basic principles in the New Testament. For instance, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 13 to 14 says, uh, Do you not know that those who minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And those who minister at the altar are partakers with the altar. Now Paul is making reference to the Levitical priesthood there. And he said, Even so has the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live off the gospel. What is that supposed to mean? It means that when people preach the gospel, they ought to take offerings when they, when they preach the gospel. And from there, they are able to take care of themselves. Galatians chapter 6 verse 6 says, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him who teaches in all good things, in all good material things. Uh, again, 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 12 says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double, double honor. honor. The word double honor there means double wages, double salary, meaning that ministers of the gospel ought to be well remunerated, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. So those are basic principles of remuneration in the New Testament. When it comes to fundraising, we see uh, the basic fundraising we see in the New Testament, we, we, saw, we can see about two examples or so. One took place in the early church in Acts chapter 4, we are everybody sold everything they had and they, they had everything in common and then they shared among everybody and ensured all the needs of the members were met. They understood the spirit of the New Testament that there's a oneness in the body of Christ. However, the method they used had its defects because 
when they became broke, all of them were broke together. Yeah. <laughs> when famine hit, all of them were broke together. Mm. And so, we now see Paul, later in the book of Acts, and we see him doing that in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, chapter, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, he is admonishing the Corinthian church to give towards, uh, to take care of the poor saints who are at Jerusalem. So Paul was carrying out fundraising. Now, you can see basic principles there. For instance, in 1 Corinthians 16, he talked about the first day of the week, they should learn to lay something, something aside. aside. So that means they give regularly. Um, he also admonished them that it is according as God has blessed each and every one. Meaning that they give systematically. The only thing is that the Bible does not tell us uh, that they did percentage giving. So specifically like the Old Testament, the only thing they said was according as God has blessed everybody. So there was a system to it. Um, there was planning to it. Uh, so everybody gave, you know, everybody budgeted and planned their finances and then gave like that. Then there were other principles he raised, like in Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, he said, Every man according as he has proposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, no necessity of, of compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So he was saying there, New Testament giving is not forced. Mm. And the spirit of New Testament giving is the spirit of giving willing offerings. Oh, Oh. It is not a matter of compulsion. Now, under the Old Testament, uh, it was a matter of compulsion. If you don't give it, you are cursed, like we mm. see in Malachi chapter 3. God told the children of Israel, you are cursed with a curse, this whole nation, because that's the law for you. You follow the law, you are blessed. You don't follow the law, you are cursed. Mm. We are in the New Testament of grace. We are all blessed in Christ Jesus. And because we are all blessed, we give because we are blessed. We are not giving in order to be blessed by God. We are blessed You're in blessed. Christ. And because we are blessed, we give. Now, so it's a matter of coming up with methods and systems uh, and they can be varied and we can be very creative with it mm. because the New Testament is not very detailed about it. So they can be varied and very detailed. The important thing is they must be in the spirit of the New Testament. Mm. Such offerings must be given willingly. Such offerings must not be forced and such offerings must be given uh, sacrificially. We can oh. see that with the Corinthian church. Such offerings should be given regularly and systematically. Oh. Uh, and so we see various methods. Some still employ tithing in the New Testament. And I mean, our ministry employs that, for instance. And you may say, why? Some are against it. Uh, because we see tithing predating the law. We see Abraham doing it in Genesis chapter 14. Uh, verses 18 to 20 and given to Melchizedek. The only thing is that when he did it, he was not forced. He did it willingly. It's an mm. act of worship as an expression or acknowledgement of his victory in battle to the Lord. He acknowledged God as the source of the provision and as the source of the victory and he worshipped with it and did it in faith. So mm. we did do it in that spirit also and not in the spirit of the Old Testament law. Uh, some of the giving we may do throughout the scriptures, Old Testament, uh, you will particularly in the Old Testament see special funds raised, like in the building of the tabernacle in Exodus 25, the, the Moses raised the offering for the building of the tabernacle, and the people gave willingly till they had even give, given too much, you know. So, uh, for projects, we also do the same thing. Uh, we, we, we challenge people to give. We have this project to do, we want you to give. And this is done at various times, in various ways. Um, what, what just matters to me, or what matters to the scripture, is that they are done within the ambit of the spirit of the New Testament. It's the spirit of grace. It's, the, it's given out of a heart of love for God. It is not forced. Mm. It, is, it is given with a heart of grace. And people are not scared into giving it. There was a time we used to, including me, we used to teach Titan that you are cursed if you don't, you know, give the tithe. But more enlightenment came through the word of God. And we began to teach. For more than a decade we've been teaching in Global Harvest that nobody should give his tithe because he's afraid of a curse. You, the new creation cannot be cursed. 
give it because you love God. Love God. And you don't even have to limit yourself to 10%. You can take it higher. But we encourage mm. people that a serious Christian should at least try to give 10% of his income to God if he's able to afford it. Then mm. he should give 10% at least you know, to the Lord. It is our opinion. It's the way we see the word of God. It's our expectation of a serious Christian. So mm. yeah, these are some of the ones we are acquainted with. But I'm aware that other churches use various methods. For instance, some will levy people. Men are to give this amount. Women are to give this amount. Young people are to give this amount. If they collectively as a church okay. agree to do it together, then it's something willing from their hearts together collectively. But nobody should be punished for not doing it. Nobody should be forced to do it. You know, while that's not our method, other people will even organize dinners, invite people from outside to come and give. It's not our method, but there's nothing wrong with it. I don't see anything in the Bible that's against it. Everybody should do whatever they are convinced they should do, but make sure it is within the principles of New Testament giving. For me mm. to say, for instance, I'm a prophet of God, and because I've just given you a word of prophecy, you must drop money uh, immediately to seal the prophecy. I, I, I'm a bit uncomfortable with such things, for instance. I'm mm. uncomfortable with it. Yeah. Praise God. So for, let me just whatever ask. ministry is offered, then people should give. Canal things. People should give in response according to the principles of scripture. Just just in that direction you went, sir, we're almost out of time. Um, so a person that is that's been has given yeah. okay, out of compulsion. That's right. What happens to that person's giving? Well, you sow the seed. I believe that seeds do grow and they germinate. However, it is not in the spirit of the New Testament. I believe that um, uh, the, the God is not happy with the person that is Coercing. forcing him to do it. He is a victim of, um, of, of, of a manipulator. Mm. Uh, uh, I believe God's mercy will be on the manipulated. But when people's eyes are open, they should not allow themselves to be, to manipulated. be manipulated. But uh, even if I'm forced to give... Because um, of the principle of seed time... God will bless me. Yes, because I also hear people at times these days attacking... Oh, you know, people are telling you to sow, uh, that um, your money, you should sow your money, you will reap. It's in the Bible, Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Paul was encouraging people to give. Why did he bring in that scripture? It was to motivate them to give, to encourage them to give. So there's nothing wrong in encouraging people that if they sow their seeds, they are going to get a harvest. We see Paul do the same thing in Second Corinthians chapter 9. In verse 8, he told them, he had told them earlier in verse 6, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Every man according as he has proposed in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly, not necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. So make sure you are doing it willingly. But mm -hmm. then he said in verse 8, but God, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, you. So that you having all sufficiency in all goodness may abound unto every good work. He was now using the scriptures again to encourage them to do the giving by letting them know if they give, they are sowing seeds and their harvest will come. There's nothing wrong with that. What is wrong is where people are manipulated and we promise them the hundredfold means God will take that money and times 100 and <laughs> give it back to you. Now, God is not a, a vending machine or uh, God is not a, a slot machine, I should say. <laughs> um, such things, the, the term hundredfold simply means maximum yield, yeah. maximum productivity, mm. not literally times 100. Thank you so, so much. So we've had such a great time with Reverend Victor at DME tonight talking about money in ministry. There's a lot, there's so many questions for us to deal with. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure there's going to be another time. In another two weeks, I, hopefully we should be able we to should do, do this again in two weeks. do this again. I know there are so many unanswered questions and we'd yes. like to answer them. So, so this is what we're going coming. to do. Yeah. Um, on this particular broadcast, especially on Facebook, you can keep sending in your questions and then we'd get them ready right. for the next time and take your questions and other questions that would come in live. Thank Fantastic. you so, so much You're for the time. We've had a great time with you. I'm glad to have you on set, <laughs> finding this question. Thank you so much. I look sir. forward to more. Thank you, sir. You're welcome.